Welcome to another episode of Just More Fix. This is James. With me in this episode is Lacey. Hey. You can find us online at justmorefix.com or on Twitter at Just More Fix. If you like us, you can support us at Patreon and you can give us a writing a review at iTunes or wherever you find us at. In this episode, we're going to talk about taking plus one forward in 2019. And now, it's time to get our gaming fix. Hi, I'm Stargate Pioneer. And I'm Stephen Jondrew, and we're from Better Podcasting, a proud member of the Gunna Geek Network. Just like the show you're listening to now. The opinions expressed are those of the individual host. Check out all the other podcasts at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. And get ready, because geekiness begins in three, two, one. Welcome to another episode of Just More Fix. A couple quick announcements before we get things rolling today. First off... You guys may have noticed that we missed a couple weeks here during the holiday. We just had a busy holiday going on for us, and I know probably most of you did as well. So hope everyone out there had a great holiday season, uh, got some extra gaming in if you had vacation time and whatnot, and had a great new year. We just returned from Houston, so we enjoyed some warmer weather, I suppose, down in the uh, Texas area, and back to the frigid cold of Indiana. A wonderful 32-hour round trip <laughs> drive. Right. <laughs> yeah. So um, this episode will be coming to you guys a day late, so it should be releasing this Thursday. And then after this, we should be getting back to our normal release schedule of Night Witches on Fridays, uh, every other Friday, and then our normal episodes on Wednesday. But everybody's, you know, the holidays get a little crazy, so... But we are back on track and ready to go, and excited to get into some more gaming for 2019. Second announcement is that we have another Indie RPG Day coming up in January. We are keeping on the track with that, and I will be running a playtest of my PBTA Troubadours game about playing, well, Troubadours, traveling minstrels in the Shakespearean era, you know, Elizabethan times, and... Uh, this will be the third playtest, and things have gone really well. And you, if you're interested in that, you can check out the blog post at the, at our Patreon. That's linked on our main website, justmorefix.com. If you're interested, you can go directly to Patreon. It's patreon.com slash justmorefix, all one word. And you can check out those blog posts there. And if you are a supporter, you can get access to some of the play materials that we've put up there that we've also previewed. And I believe we have most of the fi- the playbooks pretty much finalized uh, for the initial sort of alpha playtest part of this and i'll be getting that put together and all of the play materials put up which will be six playbooks the performance guidelines and then all the other um, odds and ends for the the basic moves and that kind of stuff put up there so if you're interested head over there and check that out and new shout out to our couple new patreon backers we have that's alan white and simon mcnair so big thanks to them for supporting us on patreon and as always a big shout out to our og of patreon supporters todd olson so everyone should go out there and be like todd because todd is awesome and so are simon and alan right on all right so as you heard we are going to do a Looking forward towards 2019. Sorry for the terrible uh, gaming pun of plus one forward into 2019, but I like Apocalypse World. Um, Occasionally, I like puns when the mood is right. I don't know. I usually like puns, but this one seems especially (laughs) especially cheesy. (laughs) I thought it would be fun uh, to go back and listen to our 2018 episode where we did this. It seems to be an annual thing now. This is our third one that we've done. Unfulfilled goals are my idea of fun also. And I thought it might be fun <laughs> to see how poorly we had done on our predictions. Oh, no. So first off, I listened to it at times two speed just a few minutes ago. Well, so. you probably missed something then. I, I probably accomplished something <laughs> that wasn't on the list. So the first thing we wanted to do, which I think is a goal we're going to set for this year as well, is to just game more. And all things considered, with your amount of schooling and clinical load, I feel like we really did game more, uh, especially with the time that we had. I definitely think that we got quite a bit of gaming done this year and had a lot of fun. What do you think? Yeah, and kind of branching out like in the gaming game with strangers quite a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Well, we got to figure we had our normal gaming groups going on, plus our indie RPG thing that we started. Mm-hmm. And that's been a lot of fun and a great well, and success. And the Night Witches thing. Like Night Witches Taffy as well. was new with mm-hmm. the group and yeah, so was I... new gaming with Holly. I've known her forever, but I never <laughs> right. got to game with her before. So I'm going to check that one off as a yes. How's that sound? So uh, these kind of go back and forth between me and you because it's how it went in the, in the actual episode. So I would like to C... bend all of oh. the evidence to make it seem like I succeeded. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> 
Seventh Sea brought to a close, and I kind of did bring that chapter to a close. Yeah. So I, I think I'm going to check it off as a success. Uh, my I, next... I mean, I would like to revisit it. Yeah, I agree like... too. But yeah, it was it was a good solid ending point to a chapter, I guess yeah. you might say. Yeah. So the next one for me is uh, Blades in the Dark, uh, six sessions, which I think we did two. Uh, so that's a big. Uh, I think it was three. So well, halfway. Mm, that's cool. a half 50%. half half success. That's, Glass is half full. That succeeded a cost, <laughs> right? The biggest part is starting it. So right. you know, it's sixty forty. <laughs> uh, my next one, which I declared on the episode was my favorite, was uh, the Genesis. Oh. Which it is still my favorite. It is really awesome. But I did not. Uh, I did lots of uh, proselytizing for the game and showed that trailer to a ton of people and raved and raved and raved and about it. Bought new books. And too. Bought new books and the whole bit. <laughs> I do think though that I'm gonna bring it to indie RPG days. That's one of the games that I plan to bring there because I mentioned it to a lot of people and there seems to be a lot of people that are interested. Mm. And I think it's a good game to sort of Bold segue move. some D and D players over to maybe because we've picked up some of the Adventures League players. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think it'd be a good game to sort of bring to bridge the gap into some. <laughs> so that's the thing I'm most proud about for this year is stealing players from D <laughs> Adventures League. That is the coolest thing. Well, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> more gaming is better, right? And the idea that we had gamers that showed up to play games, we didn't mm-hmm. you know, like they were there to game anyway. Yeah, yeah, all that nice stuff. But everybody loves an underdog, right? We all like that right. kind of like stick it to the man thing. <laughs> and, like D and D is the man of TTRPG. Every <laughs> like, every time I hear stick it to the man, I think of House of Rock and think of they have a bad case of stick it to the man neosis. <laughs> <laughs> Just an awesome Jack Black moment. <laughs> so so I that's my plan. School of Rock, that's what you're talking oh, about. Oh yeah. So, what did I say? House of Rock? It's House of Rock. I was trying to figure I don't it know. out. So yeah, yeah School of Rock. <laughs> awesome fun movie. So I'm gonna say that was a failure on that one. I think I may have ran one more game of that last year, but I don't think that I really I'm not wholly certain that you did. I may not have. I don't think it's been ran since the last Hillcon. Not True. this past, but the one before, the Hilton prior. 2017, correct. <laughs> uh, so the next one was you was running Infestation, another session of Infestation, and I don't think that happened. I did it when we went to Florida. Did we? Has that been... That was... It was 2017. Ooh, that was right before the New Year. True, true. Ooh. So that's a no. Uh, my next one was Night Witches. What I would show, I would like to say was a glaring success. That would be like a double check mark. Check, yeah. check, 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 like plus, plus, like... Like uh, there's no such thing as more than 100 percent. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> After that is Shadows of Estrin. Oh, that didn't happen at all. No, that's a big herder there. Uh, the Warren. That was me. That's a no follow. That was you. Oh, that's on my list again this year. Mm-hmm. Hey. <laughs> uh, Tremulous for me. That's a no. Microscope Explorer. That's a yes for yeah. you. Veins of the Earth for me. That's a yes. Dread for you. Score. That's, that's a, yes. a double yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> Dragonlance Fifth Age for me. That's a that makes it an X. <laughs> that's no. the no. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm sorry, my bad. I'm just gonna that's... Dragon Age. Is that what you said? Dragonlance Fifth Age. Oh, Dragonlance Fifth Age. Okay. Yeah, I was so like that's Dragon a, Age. That's I don't even no know what that me. is. <laughs> Bluebeard's Bride for you. Yeah, yeah. That's a yes. Itrus B for me. That's a fat no. And uh, Pip System Monster Hunters. Uh, I'm still waiting on that. It, it's supposed to be releasing in June. Right on. So that's a no. So I don't have it yet. <laughs> Dogs in the Vineyard for me. That's a no. And uh, Terraria. Excuse me? I'm sorry. Terraria. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I was running that game with Zeke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just mentioned how we had a lot of fun got dropped, running but... it with it. We kind of got sidetracked and there was a lot of other games that happened. So uh, the White Box, which we kind of broke out and kind of messed with a little bit, but didn't really do much with it, which I would like to this year. We'll, we'll talk about that a little later, probably. Uh, Bedlam Hall, which was a big double yep. yes on that one. And my other goal was to run Worm some more and to get that put up on the Patreon. So I did run that game some more, but I didn't really get it put, on, put up on the Patreon because as it turns out, Writing adventures is really, really kind of hard because you're not writing it for you. It's not notes for your game. It's notes for anybody's game. Yeah, I hear you. I saw three-fifths of a Dread game. Which is way <laughs> hard. Up. Right. You know, well, the I Dread is a little that. more open-ended, you know what yeah. I mean? So I feel like... That's you, I mean it's not hard. No, no, no. Right. You're right. You're right. I agree. But I think that, like, those more open-ended systems is a little easier to do because you're more, like, setting up a scenario and it just sort of, like, you see where it goes. You people, like, options without pigeonholing them into right. one specific thing, yeah. which is... 
takes a little bit more thought than right. being like typing up. This is what I did, and this is your uh-huh. box text, and this is exactly. Yeah, what well, I don't do box text because that's just terrible. I hate it. It makes me crazy. I, I don't know. I points. like when I did uh, Night of the Nutcracker. Uh-huh. It had a fair amount of box text, but it was very flavorful box text. Right. See, I like, prefer to have like bullet points of things that you want me to mention so that I can use my own language and not have to like pull that information out. That's just how I prefer things. That's when I when I look at a published adventure. That's kind of like mm-hmm. what I do, what I pull out, or whatever. So. And uh, those, oh, and then Hoosier Con, we wanted to run a game at Hoosier Con, so I got that done. We wanted to get more people back on the mics, which we really didn't do a good job of this year. Well, <laughs> so. like we tried. <laughs> Doesn't does Night Witches count? I feel like they should I count. should Come probably on. count. I agree. And then we have uh, we mentioned starting an uh, an actual play or playing in a game with all females as yeah, players, yeah. and that one I would say is a giant success. So I don't know. I feel like we accomplished. 75 percent well i was gonna say. go with 80 percent because one of our other goals was to run 80 percent of the games that are on our shelf and i'm reasonably certain that we're there now i don't know it doesn't count the we games that we bought at gen con there's some slender volumes up there that yeah make me I'm, I'm pretty sure we're there <laughs> <laughs> if i ran orpheus so that's like six of the books on our shelf. <laughs> i mean i didn't really use half of them but <laughs> You just want to jump back in and jump in here. We're going to kind of go back and forth with some things that we want to do uh, at our own gaming table for the next year. And then we'll kind of go into some podcast stuff where we want to, goals we have for the podcast and other things. Do you want to start with like things that are rolling over to the list this year? Yeah, I think it makes sense. Or things that aren't and why maybe? Yeah. Okay. So what? The things that are rolling over to the list for me. Well, the Genesis is rolling over on the list for me because... It's just too awesome to not roll over on the list, and it's amazing, and the artwork is so good, and I'm sure everyone is probably tired of hearing me rave about the Genesis, probably about as much as they're tired of hearing me rave about Veins of the Earth, but they are, the Genesis is just amazing. It's just a great game. I like it. The theme, the artwork, all of it is so good. So I'm going to get at the table, whether it's at our house or at an indie RPG day, it's going to happen. Um, I'm rolling over Follow. I had... A lot of fun, more fun than I thought I would, running one of the Microscope Explorer, the Chronicle version. I'm adding both Microscope Explorer back onto the list again to uh, hit up uh, possibly Union and uh, the other one, whose name I always forget, Echo. Um, Union and Echo, give those a try and also follow because I just, I had forgotten kind right. of how much fun that those can be. So um, I have to say, when we played that, I thought, oh, I'm going to sit in and I'll, you know, have a, you know, I'll, you know, be chipper and have a good time and whatever. But I really had a good time. I had, I had a way better time than I expected to at that. I thought I would have fun, but it was much, much more enjoyable than I expected. I really think it is a game that shines when you play it with strangers. I do too. Because you have no idea what they're going to come up with. Mm-hmm. And it works so well with that open-ended system. See, I wonder... It just really, now, I'm going to really push back on you for strangers. just a minute. And I'm, I'm curious. So in that game, we were creating something that was called the Antonius Fault, which is an mm-hmm. artifact that had appeared in several World of Darkness games that we played, right? Mm-hmm. And we detailed the history of that item. So what I'm curious about is if we did that again mm-hmm. at our table here at the house. Yes. If it would be just as good because... Everyone knowing what it is and kind of a little bit of the history of it, if and understanding each other's creative sensibilities, if it how it would change things and if it would still be just as good. I like there is one way to find out though. I agree. <laughs> and I'm not, I mean, both of them I think would be great. It's just it's just sometimes you want chocolate, sometimes you want strawberry. You know, mm. they're both great, and you don't want one all the time. It's just one of those things where it's a different style of flavor, and I wonder how much it would change things. Understanding everyone's sort of creative sensibilities and playing to everyone's strengths and whatnot, you know? That's fair. I'm just curious how it would come out, so I'm going to look at my list here. I don't know. Uh, Okay, so while you're browsing there, Shadows of Estern. <laughs> yeah, you carry that, yeah. I'm not rolling that over. Oh, you're not? I'm not. Um, If I get time to pick it up and look at it and read more of it, that's great, and it is a wonderful world and a wonderful setting, but there is so much there that it's almost intimidating, and uh, on our trip down to Texas, I read the Vornheim book. Uh-huh. And there's some things in there that make a lot of sense where Zach kind of talks about you write all of these big books and all of these worlds and it's kind of limiting in a way and it's not very useful in the moment. And there's a lot of sagely wisdom in that because so, 
part of the biggest barrier for me was in reading that and worrying that I would fall short in trying to immerse you guys in this world that right. you knew nothing about. That's okay. So that's where I was going to go is that I totally agree 100% with everything Zach says, right? If you have okay, players, when, when not everything, is. well, I'm sorry, in, in, in that case, right? In that case, I agree 100%. The only way I'm going to push back though is if you have players that are already invested in that world and have read the mm-hmm. Shadows of Vestron books, then I think you can run a very full game that will be really, really yeah, good. Yeah, absolutely. But that but takes I don't a want to assign huge, you guys homework. Right, and it takes a huge amount of investment by the players to to read some of, at least the core book, mm-hmm. or at least your faction book, or whatever it is. Right. And I don't know that you're going to get that from everyone, including myself. So. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. No, I, so I, will admit, I still absolutely love the setting and love the world, and it's it's beautiful. The artwork is beautiful. the The writing is in the book is is excellent. I, I may get to it, but I'm not putting it as a hard right yes or list. no on my list for right. this coming year. I'm gonna look down my list here. I've got the Warren. I would like to run a one shot of that again because that's not a game that's designed for long term play. No, but, but now that our kids are watching Watership Down. Could be a, oh, we could, could totally bust that amount on that. That would be a good time. <laughs> I think that's going to be on the list there. So Warren with the kids. Oh, my God. That'd be just so tragic and terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Watership Down is on Netflix now, and it's a tragedy, and it's amazing and great. And, uh, well, that's how it goes. I don't really know that... Uh, so Dragonlance Fifth Age, I'm not going to roll over. If I sort of like you with the Shadows of Vestron thing, if I get to it, it would be cool. But I have something else coming up new on the list that kind of involves some of the things about the Dragonlance and Fifth Age that I really enjoy that I'm going to sort of pull from. Mm. So while it's not on the list per se, it kind of is halfway, if that makes sense. Okay. I feel like the list is a lot more serious now that I'm going to be held accountable for the list. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's just <laughs> no, interesting just... to look back and see, you know, it I wanted to totally do these is. things. Did I actually get it done? Because I have some – there aren't as many games that I want to run this year, but I have some abstract goals for me that I really, really, really want to go after. So another one I'm rolling over is Itris B. It's just I have a strange place in my heart for surrealism and that sort of dark surrealist stuff. And a lot of the artwork I've seen is so amazing and really cool. And I really think I'm going to make it happen. It's just I've gotten more comfortable with running some of these stranger games and more atmospheric and thematic stuff, and I think that I'm really ready to sort of take it on and go after it. So, is there anything else? What else is uh, you got? Pip really? system on there? I think you're probably rolling that one over, right? Yes, yes, I'm. I'm rolling Pip system over uh, for two reasons. First of all, the uh, Kids Guide to Monster Hunting is supposed to be coming out in June of this year, so. I am looking forward to getting my hands on that. And are we getting that as a PDF, or are we getting PDF? Yeah, very cool. I have that coming as part of the Kickstarter backing. I had a chance to read through the book and kind of talk about it, and I I feel like pretty comfortable since I ran Infestation a couple times that I can use this. But I I really want to do a Discworld game, and I think this would lend itself well to that. Um, And I kind of had a a bit of a mental block with the satire, but I, I think that I've got it worked out now um it just kind of took me a minute to shove myself over the (laughs) (laughs) over the hump with that yeah i'm wanting to kind of delve into that a little bit more because the discworld is just such a cool setting couldn't agree more i love discworld so much but i just don't know how to run a discworld game and Mm -hmm. we've kind of talked about that and i'm pretty sure we're gonna talk about that some more as the year goes on yeah, well, because the just like the difference between running something that's just like slapstick and you're right you know, what's the word? Kind of, I don't know, like that cheesy humor, but... Dick and if, fart jokes? Right. And I don't want it to, like, <laughs> devolve into that. Well, there's a piece of that there, but it can't there be the is, only piece. but, yeah. yeah. There like has the to be something... The satire element is so important. Right. So you have, have to have the, start, like, those... the news or something. Those s- <laughs> subtle little jokes, or not subtle, the not-so-subtle jokes on the surface, right? Right. And then beneath it all is the satire that sort of runs through the entire thing, right? So I think I've I think I've got a good feel for it. Right on. And I think we're actually in an excellent period of time right now to run a satire game. There's a lot of material there. Oh so. yeah, absolutely. I don't know. I've got worms on here, and I think I'm just going to go ahead and put up what I have worked up already. I've just got to type it out. It's just it turned into a little bit more than I had kind of anticipated uh, because I've never actually written an adventure for other for other people to run. Right. I've got loads and loads of game notes and things, but those are my games. And it's just like anything else. When you look at, when you go to a class and you look at someone else's notes, you don't really get what 
is actually going on. Right. So I'm not entirely sure it would be super useful to any, everyone to sort of be able to use to run a game. But I think there's enough there to draw some inspiration from. And if nothing else, I'm just going to throw it up on the Patreon and, and with what I have and, and put it out there. And if it if it develops more from there, then that's great. And if not, that's fine too. But I think uh, at least I can just throw it up there and it can be out sort of out there in the wild and grow and do its own thing. So, um, so I've ran Bluebeard's Bride t- Three times now in the last year, I think I so. Say somewhere in that ballpark, and then played it at Gen Con, um, not this Gen Con, but the one previous. So, yeah, but we've gotten a book of rooms that I we did have when I ran it last time, right. and I, and I did use that, and it mm-hmm. was it was helpful. Well, those um, I will say that the we have all four books now. All four books have came out. So you have the core book, the book of rooms, the book of lore, and then the book of mirrors. And I really do think that the Book of Rooms does a really good job of showing you how to – giving you some more tools to run that a very difficult game and, and sort of turn it up a, a little bit, you know, to make you understand yeah, things. Absolutely. But also to give you more tools to amp the horror up and, and the different kinds of that feminine horror that exists in there. And I found for a lot of the things, like I was stealing bits and pieces of it but not using it exactly, right. which I think is really the best – Oh yeah, way to have a, a tool Absolutely. for a game because it, then you're giving it your own voice. So, and I will say, there are a lot of games out there that have lots of supplemental material that I think, oh, this is neat, but you don't really need this. And I will say, a hundred percent, that Bluebird, the additional material for the Bluebird's Bride. If you're if you're struggling with running that game, those books will one hundred percent help you run that game. And if you're already running it successfully, they they will help you take it to the next level a hundred percent. And they're beautiful. Yeah, and they're so. amazing artifacts yeah. as well. <laughs> in addition to that, we have uh, they're on. They should be on the way. Uh, the deck of servants and the deck of items as well. They should be on their way here already. So, in addition to that, so since the book of rooms, there's the book of mirrors and what's the other one? Book of lore. The book of lore. Um, so I haven't had a chance to peruse those yet. So that's probably that's. I mean, it's definitely. I brought the the core book up here. It's it's on my list for this right. year um, to look through those books as well and uh, see how I can kind of enhance that. I just, mm, I might run it for strangers. I don't know. It's a, it's a sticky point for me because I want to make people uncomfortable, but only with their consent. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean? and like, you want to like. It's rough. I don't know. I know, and I know. I can run it on our home table, and I think I could run it at a larger con because people would know what they were showing up There's for. enough people, yeah, yeah, yeah. But at a, a smaller thing or at an indie RPG day is where I'm not sure. Like right. if you have people that aren't familiar with it at all and they're just kind of showing up not knowing what they're getting into, that makes me kind of nervous. Right. And so. the game, I, I think you really – four is ideal. Five, it, five works too. But I think with three people, I'm not sure – it, it changes the game quite a bit because depending on which playbooks aren't present, you know? Oh, yeah. And... I think you could do it with three, though. I do, too. I would, I, I would run it with three. I think, I think three is the minimum, though. I don't, I'm don't. i not sure it works with two people. You could definitely do it, but I just think that it would not shine in the way it would with three, four, or five. I think that's true for most Apocalypse World games. Very true, yeah. I, I believe, I don't know for certain, but I believe the the book of lore is just a story. It's just it's just like prose and things to think about and awesome stuff there. And then the book of mirrors is additional play sets. So there's a jail one and an asylum one and a, a school one and some other things. So Which I'm excited about for our home table because I ran it twice for you guys in the kind of traditional sense. So it'll be cool to have that. You know, though, I really... It's been significantly different both times. Yeah, so. I, I could sit down and play Bluebeard's Bride and have it be regular old Bluebeard's Bride every time and be happy with it because... Plus, I like that I get to accumulate a bride at the end of each thing. Right. So now I have this new room. So with the last one, I incorporated the previous bride from the game I ran yeah. for you guys into this one. Well, and fun. then you only have a maximum of five rooms. So I... How how can I really exhaust your creativity with only five rooms? That's it. I'm t- every time I'm tapped out, guys. You know, so like, well, but like all the different inspiration and things that you I've have only to draw from. I've experienced five horrible things in all of my life. <laughs> I just think it's super interesting, and it it's a game that I feel like has a lot of replay because it's sort of like it's teasing you with horror. Mm-hmm. You like you might play this game. You might only have three rooms. You might have three tokens of disloyalty or loyalty, and then just like that, it's over. And, or you might go the whole length and have all five. But either way, five rooms is not that much. They're so punishing, though. So I've never been in, like, the Bluebeard's Bride game. I mean, I've only played in it once, but I certainly wasn't like, yeah, I wish I could explore some more rooms. <laughs> I'm like, oh, God, this no, is no, no, terrible. No, 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 I think it ended at exactly the right time. <laughs> but what I all I'm saying, though, is that I think it's a game that I, I wasn't sure it would have a lot of replayability. But I think it has a ton because... 
it always leaves you like when the game ends, it's always at the climax. It's never it's gone on too long, mm-hmm. you know, and it and it draws you once to come back. Not right away because it is a dark game, but when the moment is right and you're like, ooh, I would love to play a dark game. Well, I don't think that there is a better game for darkness than than that one. Right. I think that's all the things that carry over from the list from before. So I'm just going to I'm going to start real quick, if you don't mind, because I have a couple things that we mentioned for games that were coming out in the next year Mm -hmm. that we have now. So the first one, everyone knows that we are big, big World of Darkness fans and V5 came out and there has been a ton of controversy uh, surrounding V5. um, But I still think that it is the strongest mechanically it is the strongest vampire and even if i choose to take it back to 1984 or 1994 and run a game that takes place in 94 i'm still going to use v5 because i truly think that this is the strongest mechanical game of vampire all that said though uh, i know that there's been a ton of controversy surrounding it and a lot of people have been upset about some things and whatever but I'm really, really pleased with the core book. I really, really just enjoy what they have done with Vampire. I'm not entirely certain where they're going to take the storyline and the meta into the future, but I'm and I'm very intrigued by it. But V5 itself as a mechanical system, even if you just want to use it to run, you know, 90s angsty, you know, goth punk stuff, then I think that's the way to go. The V20 book is great, but it's so big and intimidating. It's kind of like you don't even know where to begin with it, whereas this is like a regular core RPG book, right? It's thick, but it's like a regular – it's it's a regular core I'm RPG sure book. I'm not much bigger than – that much smaller than the V20. <laughs> oh, it is. The V20 game book has, I think, 600 or 800 pages in it. And how many does this one have? Uh, well, let's take a look. <laughs> Drum roll. Are we including the index? 398. Hmm. Ah. And I I know for certain that the v, V20 book has at least like 600. It's crazy. Okay. So someone said that one on the floor. But so. I still don't look at it and think, oh, this is a manageable endeavor. <laughs> <laughs> well, but there's a lot of source material inside there as well. So it's not just, yeah. you know, when, when, and when you look at other vampire stuff, like, just like what you said with. Shadows of Estra and holds true with Worlds of Darkness. That's what keeps a lot of people away from it is that it is so big. And this V5 book, it's a lot more manageable and mechanically, it's just the greatest system Vampire has ever had, I think. Hunger is amazing. So I want to run a V5 game. I kind of, I not kind of, I did start one and we ran one pretty large session. We had a large table that night though. I think there were seven players and it was a little much. But it was a good session, and I really liked the way that the, uh, the relationship map. The contacts and yes. stuff, the relationship map was, yeah, that was really solid. So I want to run another V5 game. I think it's just a matter of uh, getting a, co- a group together that this is going to be our vampire group and we're going to play. And I kind of like the idea of starting specific things once a month. It's something I've really kind of come around to for our gaming is that, like, this is the vampire game and this is the this game. And I think it's going to change. It's one of my goals for this year, actually, that I'm going to mention is that um, more purposeful gaming, I guess, you know, and, uh, yeah, I just, I, I love vampire. I love world of darkness. It's so good. So just like veins of the earth, I love <laughs> vampire. <laughs> so I'm going to skip ahead to something that I want to play Uh-oh. Uh, since I know it's on your list. Anyway. So is this like a jab at me for what you want to play? <laughs> no. Um, okay. I'm looking forward to playing hot springs Island. Um, oh! I see you have the field guide in the stack over there. I do. Here it is. And I know you're planning on writing it and <laughs> I am super excited. It's like one of the two like things that are on my list to like, I just want to play this. Right. So I guess I'll pick it up from there. So hot springs Island has been on my list for a while. I saw it before Gen Con last year and was super excited about it and got the PDFs and then went to Gen Con and it was at the Lamentation, the LOTFP booth and Jacob Hurst was there and I talked with him for a few minutes and I, I bought the books mm-hmm. and I'm just super excited about it. It's The it's- Dracula dossier changed my mind about a lot of things about how players aids and how you get information to the players and I really like the idea that there's a field guide that you give to the players and say, here you go. And it's a $40 book, and it's it's worth $40. The production quality is very nice. The artwork, mm-hmm. there's a ton of stuff in it. It's a very nice book. And I saw lots of people online in discussions on forums say, you're going to let your players write in that book? And normally I'm kind of a, 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 a prissy book 
person and I don't like my books torn up and I don't like the binding broken. But when I buy something with the intention that I want them to write in it, right? In my game, there will only ever be one field guide. Just like in my Dracula dossier games, there will only ever be one Dracula dossier. So write in it, mark it up, put notes in it, write things that might be true, might be not true. And this is the only one the players will ever encounter. I struggle. I just, I just struggle with it. I'm know. excited for it. It's just so pretty. <clears throat> but I don't know. The The big thing for me is... Like you were telling me about it, and I was like, okay, Hot Springs Island, OSR, Hex Crawl, whatever. <laughs> and then I saw the book, and I was like, I want to open this, and I want to look at it, and I want to touch it, and I want to feel it. And then I started reading it, and I was like, this is phenomenal, and well, the creatures in it are so cool. So I'm reading The Dark of Hot Springs Island, which is the GM book to this, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you what, I I have some apprehension because – just the same way that there was so much in Dracula dossier that was so good, mm-hmm. I feel similar to this, right? The only the only benefit to to Hot Springs Island is is that I'm not up against Bram Stoker and a literary literary classic that I have to sort of contend <laughs> with, right? So it takes some of that pressure off. But everything that is in there is so good and so different and so original, and I'm just super excited to run it. And I'm I'm really kind of like that that 15 year old teenager in high school in the library. That like is you know writing something in the margins. I, I'm excited for you guys to write in this book. There's something in me that's just like I want. I want to. I want you guys to do that, and I want to mark it up. <laughs> and then it'll all. The thing that's cool about it though is it will always sit on the shelf, and it will always be a record of the game that we had. And I think that that's very very cool. And that another game might come back to the Hot Spring Island, and you guys might encounter it again. And then it's kind of like a cool way to encounter all those stories again, right? Yeah. And I, I really really hope that other publishers follow in this direction because in the same way we were talking about Shadows of Vestron, right? It's an easy way to give the players information and have them be excited about it and have it at the table for them to look through because there's so many Game Master books that that the players can't look in because there's secret information in there and there's so much work and effort and creativity that's put into that that never comes out. Whereas with this, you can just say, hey, anything in here is open game. And then it also gives your players the agency to say, I like this part here in this book. I like these these um, salamanders that are controlling the world. I like the night axe or whatever, you know, and and run with that plot. And it gives them a thing for them to pick the thing that they like and they want to pursue. And I'm just super excited for it. So I made my own character sheet and laid it all out. And I'm going to put that up as well. I'll probably just put that up uh, on the regular website for anybody that wants to see it. It's using the Eldritch Cock rules modified for Lamentations. And it's, I'm, I'm going to email... Um, both Raji and Jacob to make sure it's okay because I have their logos in it and stuff like that. So if it, if we just use it at our table, it's cool. But um, I think it'll work well. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna rave about our game too for too long. So I'm just gonna set it down. So I'll shut up <laughs> because I have a tendency tendency to ramble. Ramble. So so I'll go I'll go next because you 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 stole Hot Springs Island from me. So I don't really steal it. Like, you mentioned <laughs> way more. Is there anything that you want to play? Like what's on your list to play? Ooh, not just man. run. I didn't even think about a list to play. So, See, I included that in mine, so that's why. I well, in there. kind of mix it. Mix I'm, it together. I'm probably going to steal some thunder from you here for a minute, but I'm really excited to play in your Beasts of Jevudan game. Mm-hmm. So I'll just intro the game. There's we use the Frostbit and Mutilated book for Lamentations, and me, Carrie, and Lee, all three made three witch sisters, uh, sisters in quotes. Uh, and we have kind of like the three archetypes of the of the witch. <laughs> a the... cult, I believe they call it a cult. <laughs> a coven, we have, maybe. We have the uh, the the virgin, the crone, and the um, the fem the fem fatale. The fem fatale. And it's a great game. It's so much fun. And we're there because of this agreement that was made a long time ago between the the male and female aspects of things and the sun and the moon and stuff. And I thought we were going to go there to kill the kill the werewolf <laughs> because that's what you do is kill werewolves, right? Yeah. I thought it was going to be some dude that tapped into the feminine power of the moon and now he turns into a beast and we got to go kill him. And in fact, no, we have to go there and make sure he lives as long as he can to fulfill this bargain. And let me tell you, did that sort of gym up my plans to go where <laughs> wolf hunting. <laughs> so it's like, how can I cast doubt at other people? Meanwhile, my character, all wedding rings within 50 feet of me, like squeeze fingers off. Well, if there wasn't, wasn't anything that said, Hey, 
set that woman on fire. <laughs> I think that's probably it. So it's been a lot of fun. And I'm going to say this, and it's not to throw shade at games that we've played in, but I've been playing games for a long time, and I still enjoy playing games. But there are certain ones that really stand out to me, and I'm like, I, this is a game that I really like and I really want to play. And this is this is one of those games because it's just so very different. And I know you're excited to run it, and that sort of plays into something that, that I have picked up from you is that it, you always talk about being excited to run to play in games that people are excited to run. Mm -hmm. And the werewolf craze that happens in France in the 1600s 1700. is – yeah, yeah, 1700s, I'm sorry, is crazy. Mm -hmm. It's like full-on Eastern Europe <laughs> vampire crazy, right? And so, I don't know, I just have this this sort of, uh, well, Lamentations has sort of turned me or brought me around to the idea of these sort of uh, historical games and they have like these culturally significant moments that are really cool in Europe. And I'm just excited to play it. It looks like it's, it's, it's a lot of fun and I really like my character and it's cool as hell. And badass. So, <laughs> so I sometimes have a problem where I have this idea and I'm like, this is such a cool thing. And then we run it for like two or three sessions and I realize that I didn't put any amount of prep into it that was necessary <laughs> to continue <laughs> doing the thing. And it's hard to when you do a historical fiction game and don't really know any history at all because it was always like Snoozeville in high school. Uh, and the rest of my life. So, but... Well, to be fair, I don't think I taught like 1700s France in high school. Well, I, <laughs> so. I might have paid attention if there had been werewolves. Like, <laughs> maybe they should have included this in history. I True might enough. have learned something. True like, if you taught me about King Louis with werewolves, I might have paid a little bit of attention. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, it was actually really interesting to read about this time period and like what's going on and... And werewolves. So it is so good. Um, but so, so I'm working on more prep for it than I've probably done for any game. Um, and I've been creating a list of NPCs and like what the town actually looks like now that you guys are there. And I may have to rework a couple of things that I created uh, with nonsense out of nowhere um, to make it make more sense. But I actually started using the Vornheim book for this uh -huh. just to kind of flesh out the NPCs because it has a really good. Um, some random table generators for uh -huh. city NPCs and for nobles. And I like how it kind of builds up some conflict in between people without me having to put a whole lot of thought into it. Right. So, and it kind of, even if you don't use it like straightforward, it sparks off other um, interesting ideas right. that you can kind of work well, with. Well, it does what I like random tables to do is from, to give me ideas to jump off from. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I, I'm not, there's an episode a ways back that is James versus random tables. Yeah. And I really don't like them, but Allegedly. I I do like them <laughs> when they're structured in the way that they are in Vornheim, where it's it's things that make sense and give you cool ways to sort of spring your own creativity off of them and make you think about things in a new way, as opposed mm -hmm. to just like, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You know? So there's some things that are like, okay, well, this doesn't quite work for, because um, it's, it's not exactly an urban area. area. Right. But it's not completely rural either. Um, it's actually really hard to find historical material that tells you how many people lived in a town. Oh, <laughs> like, I have something for you then. What size is this town? I don't know. Um, so there's a little bit of um, creative guesswork happening. Well, there. But anyways, so I'll some have of the to see if I can find it. There's a thing that I have that if you can find a general population of the city that you can put in a time period, and it will generate like there would be three blacksmiths and two can sh chandlers and three tanners and whatever mm -hmm. in this entire town. It's actually there's stuff for that too. Uh, in there, there's well, there's actually a, a historical. I don't know how accurate that is. If you or I, what you want to go for, but it's I don't really care. No, I know, but it's very cool. <laughs> it's like you're like, oh, cool. There's like six basket weavers in this town. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like these um, I did look up some traditional French names for the area. Right. So I've got like my own index card of random name generation for male and female first names and for French surnames, just and what they mean, just because I find that kind of interesting. So yeah, so that's that's definitely on my list and. um Obviously, the the end is the werewolf dying, and and everybody knows that 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 is what's going to happen. Um, the goal is to just prolong it as long as possible. Um, well, I hope you know destruction. I'm going to confiscate those three characters when this game is over because <laughs> I'm going to use them for something else. I'm going to make them bad guys in some Good. kind of a game. Good. 
I really like the three of our characters. They're very cool. Yeah, they're well done. And, and um, I thought it was interesting because, and I'm just getting kind of game story or whatever, but um, when we went into it, I, I gave you guys the caveat that you had to be women because in order to right. be a part of this um, lunar goddess worshiping group, you, you have to be female. Well, I in the Frostbit and Mutilated book, the class witch says that you can make it a male and have it be a warlock, but it is way less compelling. And I have to agree 100%. You know, in my mind, when I think male person who casts spells, I think of sort of someone who is like a, a wizard or a sorcerer or something mm-hmm. along those lines. Not that witch style, right? It's just not as compelling that way. Well, and, and for the mythology that I was going for, right. like I, I, you, like you just need to be a woman. Mm-hmm. I don't care what kind of woman you right. could be. You could be a trans woman if you wanted to. I don't care, but right. you have to be some kind of woman for it right. to really like resonate and make sense. Well, I'm going to use this as sort of segue into my next thing, right? And when we played that game, Carrie said something to me. She's like, "Wow, I really like your character." When we were done with the game, she's like your female characters are way different now, right? Mm -hmm. And Night Witches has 100% done that for me. (laughs) Because, well, it's made me see games differently and see characters differently. And I always, my solution was, previous to this, was when I would make a character, I just wouldn't think about whether it was male or female beforehand. I would just make a character with motivations and goals. And then I would apply sort of like the male or female ethos to it or whatever, right? And that's how I did vampire. And for vampire, it kind of makes sense because once you become a vampire, you're not male or female anymore. You're vampire, right? You're mm. you're creature of the night, you know, predator supreme, you know? So right. that stuff doesn't really matter anymore. But in like your game, the Beast of Shade of Dawn game, or in this Night Witches game, it's a very big piece of this. And I... I wanted to make sure that my NPCs came to light in a different way and were had sort of like personality that wasn't cookie cutter and they were real characters. And I I don't know how to say or put my put a finger on something that I did, but I just approached the game differently. And it, when Carrie said that to me, I was like, okay, well then I'm doing something right now. Like I feel like I've I've done something good. So it, it's hard, like even even being a, a female, like. And and I kind of realized it when I was using the Vornheim table for my aristocrats because I already had people in names and like what gender they were and who they were. So just kind of using it to flesh out details. And when it came to adding some of the goals and some of the, you know, other background information about the NPCs, I, you know, things would come up and I'd be like, oh, well, that that is really cool applied to a, a female NPC, right? Uh-huh. Um, because even like running and, and GMing, like I, I try to to be as diverse as possible with my characters, but a, a lot of times you just end up with like one of three females, right? You have the damsel who's like, oh, woe is me in order to manipulate you to get to do things for her. Right. There's the, the naive, I can't do anything for myself actually person. And then there's the boss bitch. And it's right. like those three people <laughs> and that's all that there ever is, right. you know? Uh, and that's it's really just not okay. <laughs> I don't know really that's the best segue or whatever, but I just love Night Witches so much. It is really awesome. <laughs> the, if you haven't checked out our actual play, you definitely should, even if you just want to see the way drama plays out at a table and, and that kind of stuff. And the game is sort of taking some twists and turns. And I always warn people the first three episodes or the first session of the actual game is a little slow because we're sort of learning the way the world's w- rules work and all that kind of stuff. But I really, really enjoy the game, and it's so good. It's just such a great game and a great way to build tension. And I don't know how I'm going to ratchet up the tension as the game goes by, but that is actually one of my goals is to go from 11 to like about a 13. <laughs> so, Well, somebody's probably going to die in the next session. It's, it's, we've, we've taken so many marks. It's amazing nobody's died yet, but uh, I know I don't have that many left in my sheet, and I know um, some of the other ladies at the table – well, I'm kind really of curious to see what marks. happens because I know many of you are not don't have a lot of marks left, and and for those of you that don't know, one of the marks is accept your final fate and and embrace it, right? Which is yeah. death. Which naturally you save to the end. <laughs> and I'm kind of curious because all of you are coming up on that point where you don't have many marks left. So how mm-hmm. many of your how many of you are going to die in the same session? And then does that mean the game should end then? Because the st- I think we're gonna we're gonna spread it out a little more. Than you think so? Think because like Carrie has a whole slew true, left, true. and um, 
Uh, and Tavi has quite a few left. Right. Um, Holly just has an abysmally small right. amount, and <laughs> I don't have very many left either. But it's it there's there's still a decent spread of how many are left for everybody. So. Well, I'm kind of curious to see how it's going to go, and I'm super excited, but also dreading it at the same time because <laughs> it's like that point in the movie where the bad stuff is coming, and you know it's going to happen, and you've enjoyed it so much. So what do you do, right? Right. So I'm going to sort of pick up from this, from Night Witches, and go into something else, which is more of an abstract goal that I have for the year, is that I want to involve more emotional engagement with the games that I'm running. And I don't know necessarily know how to do that or what I'm going to do to, do to make that happen. But running the Night Witches game and seeing how you guys are so involved in your characters and really are invested in what's happening, that I want to take a piece of that and have that in all the other games that we play. So I'm not sure how I'm going to do that entirely, but I'm definitely going to pay attention to it and and work towards that. And I think part of that is work on my end to make sure that I'm building a a world that is full and engaging and full of people that make sense and are seem real and tangible. Mm -hmm. But that's one of my big goals for this year is not necessarily some of the games that I want to run, but the the games that I am running, I want to involve more emotional engagement in and and have them be more immersive. At Gen Con, we picked up some Power by the Apocalypse um, novellas. They're they're Ashcan games from Magpie. Um, So for those of you that don't know, an Ashcan game is something that they have where it's pretty much flushed out to where you have something that's playable, but it's not an entirely complete game. And it's kind of to see and get some feedback on them and how they work. So one of the ones we picked up was called The Ward. And so it's a medical drama. And uh, I I feel like I could run this really well. That's really more the reason that I picked it up. And so I think I could do a really good job with this. I don't. I I <laughs> not even that I don't disagree. I know for a fact because you spent enough time in an ER to know that you can run this game perfectly, right? Yeah, I think it'll be fun. My only problem is that. I just don't know. It's like it's like a little too close to home. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you say that, but I think you would enjoy it because you like mashed, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm cautiously. You like the disco ambulance of Spirit of Seven Seven. Oh God! Well, that's <laughs> right. But the goal is to be like just close enough because this is ridiculous in its own right too. Just like Grey's Anatomy is ridiculous yeah, yeah, in yeah. its own right. It's like you know? ER, basically. It's not right. Yeah, exactly. So, um... but see, with those kind of yeah. games, though, what I really want. And it's sort of like how MASH does. I want it to run right up to the line where it's like, oh, my God, this is so close, right? Mm-hmm. And then I want – from that point, I want the OR scene to end and I want it to go into the ridiculousness that is trying to navigate life in the Korean War and the MASH and get supplies and blah, 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 right? That's what I like about MASH so much is that it went right up to that line where it's like this is a little too close, but it's still fun and engaging and then it backs away. That's what I liked about Mashed. Yeah. So I well, think you I'm, could totally I'm, do it with that. I've got to read it through, and we're going to give it a try, and that's all I'm saying. I'm, 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 I'm all about it. We're just going to give it a try. So I'm ready to be a jerk doctor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so also in that uh, in that Ashcan game vein is Velvet Glove. And we already did Bluebeard's Bride, so I feel like like Sarah Richardson's really getting a nod from us. Yeah. But um, I And this is being developed into a full game. I don't know if the other one is eventually or not. I, I, I know that's kind of like the plan, but I actually I follow her on Twitter, so I, I see occasionally where she's mentioned, like... Well, I've listened to her talk like on that, Ken and Robin, so. and she talked about it, uh, where it was going, and I know it's been to Metatopia and played a few times. And right. So I think it's it's probably going somewhere. So I've already read through this one, and there was some kind of initial excitement drummed up after Gen Con about it, and then it kind of got pushed to the wayside for me as I was working on like some Tales from the Loop and some other stuff right. um, for Indie RPG Day. But uh, I'm definitely going to get back to this, and we are going to give it a try. I'm going to watch some awesome movies to do... Uh, some research. Quote, research. Quote. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that's that's on my list for sure. All right, so I'm gonna just bust through a couple here. I have a whole stack of adventures. What is that? What even is that? Right there on the front. <laughs> yeah. So I will tell you in a moment. <laughs> so I have a stack of adventures here that I just recently got from Lamentations. So or not all of them are from Lamentations, but several of them are. So these are adventures that I want to run now. Whether I run them here for our home group or at the Indie RPG Day thing, I'm not entirely sure, but. I'm just going to go through them really quick. So first I have from Patrick Stewart, 
awesome Patrick Stewart, Veins of the Earth, that is an amazing book, is Deep Carbon Observatory. That's the first one. The second one is Forgive Us, and that one is by Kelvin Green. And after that is England Upturned by Barry Blatt and Fish Fuck, which is my favorite because it's awesome. <laughs> Because it has the word for time. <laughs> well, my favorite thing is when they put this on the internet, they like blurt over the like they like over the bar, and it's like fish f star 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 e r s, which makes me laugh every time. And this is by, I think it's Zarkov, isn't it? I believe so. Let me double check. I just hear the title every time and think Insmith. <laughs> oh, it's by Kelvin Green. There you go. And Punchline by Zarkov Kowalski, which is another one that I'm excited about. So yeah, that looks good. Super excited. I've been watching the art creation and all of that. Yeah. So. Well, at first I was and there like. there's some other awesome people involved in the creation mm-hmm. of that. Yeah. So Kyle was involved with yeah. the layout of things, the maps and the cartography. Uh, Zarkov was involved with the, he wrote the adventure. And then Journeyman 1099 maybe. I'm not sure what the num- numerics are, but we follow him on Twitter and he did the artwork for it. And it's just all amazing. And I'm really, really excited to try and get to it. So hopefully some. LCFB modules. Put it on my list for 2019 to just buy, read, and run anything that Kyle produces because <laughs> <sighs> I don't want to be all like fangirl about it, but like I really well, liked Blood in the Chocolate. It was so freaking amazing. And then we, I got that Nutcracker PDF and I ran it for you guys and it was just fun. Like I didn't want it to end. He just he just makes things that are that are lighthearted and fun, but I agree. without being like dumb you know what i mean yeah so there's a problem where where when you say lighthearted and fun people automatically think it means it doesn't have much substance to it and that is 100 percent not the case when it comes to the stuff that kyle makes it's very lighthearted very fun just good old-fashioned fun right Mm -hmm. like used to have when you were playing D D when you're 16 years old right that kind of fun but it still has amazing depth and the characters are are great and full characters and there's lots of moving pieces to the adventure it's just it's just good just good agreed which is why i think (laughs) my goal for 2019 is to just run anything that kyle produces (laughs) right on (laughs) (laughs) um i have another i want to play this thing and so maze of the blue medusa is awesome and by oh zach yeah but well patrick stewart um, since he's a theme here oh, it's so <laughs> weird um so carrie started running this for us and like we've even like encountered the medusa and everything and then just like she got a new teaching job and was like being a scholastic bowl coach and some nonsense like that for real life and she should just quit all those things <laughs> and run this game for me i ask her about it literally every time she comes over to her house i'm like oh hey did you right. did you bring this with you because you could totally run that <laughs> and there's a painting in our gaming room now of the maze and i so my question is I is, just is it cheating if you're it? looking at the at the painting to decide <laughs> where you want to go First of all, I wouldn't do that. Because <laughs> I had that thought when I was in the process of yes. ordering it. So <laughs> I was ordering this painting and I was like, if this is on the wall in the gaming room and we play this game, does that constitute, you know? <laughs> Carrie just has to run like in a position where she's looking at it and the rest right. of us are. <laughs> or not. Right. Very good. No. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just phenomenal. And I I want to explore it some more and probably just like never leave it. Right. <laughs> So the next book in my stack is Itrus B, but I've already gone on about that enough. And everyone knows it's the <laughs> surreal RPG of surreal noir and dark, and it uses cards and blah, blah, blah. Itrus B. So after that is Shadows of Her Soul. And this year I watched The Expanse, the first and second season, and I was just blown away by it. It's a great show. And the guys that make Shadows Over the Soul, which is made by Tab Creations, they sent me a copy of this book and asked us to review it. And I told them that we really only take a look at smaller press stuff and that we don't do negative reviews because if your game isn't for us, there's no reason for us to poo-poo all over your game, right? But it uses cards, which automatically sort of grabs me because I like <laughs> cards, right? And it is it is the expanse in a lot of ways, and I really, really like it. So I want to get it to the table because I want to see if it's a game that we like and can make work for our table, and then hopefully do a review for it. And I 
from reading the book, it really just seems like it captures the expanse feel very well where there's no faster than light travel. It's a, it's a realistic science fiction game. So it's in space. I love that they included the um, Cassini satellite photos from NASA. Oh, yeah. It, as part of the artwork. Right. Uh, they're open source images. And why would you not? Like yeah. if you're writing a, uh, a realistic, uh, I guess it sounds kind of counterintuitive to say realistic science fiction, but that's, you know, no, it what makes it is. sense it's because like I think saying it's... low fantasy instead of high right, fantasy. Right, you know what right. I mean? Um, well, I think it's super important because, but yeah, just brilliant. You know, it's it's definitely not 40k. It's it's right. It's or almost, Star Wars, right? It's almost feasible science fiction right now with with just a little bit of push on what you know Tesla is doing and and Elon Musk. This is okay. very feasible. This is the same thing, right? Well, you know. <laughs> So I'm super excited for this game, and I want to get to the table, and I'm planning it to run for our home group and probably taking it to the, to an indie RPG day because there's a one-shot that's really cool that I like that has a good feel to it that I found for this. So look for a review for Shadows Over Soul coming from us because I really think it's going to be a good game. I'm excited for it. So this goes kind of back to the follow-through thing. We were talking about outlandish game ideas, and um, the more I thought about it, the more I like the idea of Legend of Zelda as a dungeon crawl. Um, mega dungeon, I guess, if you would, or mega dungeons, dungeon crawls together. Is there a word for a bunch of different dungeon crawls that know. are sort of a thing together? I don't know if there's a term for that. Epic. <laughs> epic. I think An that's epic it. Legend of Zelda adventure. There you go. Um, and so I got this lovely Legend of Zelda encyclopedia that is the coolest book ever. I agree. Uh, and it looks like the whoever got that for you was a Nintendo genius. Nintendo cartridge thing. I ordered it myself. I thought I got that. Uh, negative. God damn it. <laughs> but I appreciate I the suck compliment. At life. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so I've started. I really thought I ordered that. No, I didn't. Nope. Negative. Man. So I've started thinking about the the different creatures and and things and how to best represent those and um, there'll probably be some use of the random esoteric probably be some use of the random esoteric creature generator to kind of flush things out. Um, it's really a useful tool for creating things oh, yeah. that you sort of have a vague idea about too, even if it's not completely random. So so like it becomes a pick list instead of a random table, right? Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to try and flush that out some more. I know we've been like doing the Troubadours thing hardcore. Yeah. It'd be funny if we took all of the ideas from the ridiculous podcast thing and made them actual things. All right. So my final book in my stack is Through the Breach, which for those of you that don't know, is the Malifaux world, which is a minis game uh, brought into an RPG. And... It uses cards, <laughs> so there you go. James likes cards. Uh, there's lesson number one, but I really like the world of Through the Breach. It's sort of like this steampunky kind of world with a little bit of a twist to it, and I just really like the world. It's very cool with this sort of clash between science and the mystic world. Mm -hmm. I really like the collision of those two, and I feel like it really happens. It's easy to bring that in during the Industrial Revolution with with the expansion of the railroad and the Western kind of a theme, which is what this kind of game is. Well, right? that's important, but the other important thing that's happening there is stuff about workers' rights and yeah. safety and exploitation of poor people. Right. And and that's an important element that makes steampunk oh, yeah. and, and that sort of science fiction a reality because there aren't regulations about how <laughs> no. far you can push right. uh, the terrible things that you're doing uh, in the name of science. Right. So I got the first it's kind edition. Kind of a gothic horror kind well, of element. It you has know? a very gothic feel to it, like the sort of. I mean, that's what it is. Darkness you know, hiding in the background. Man versus technology, right. and what happens when you go too far? Like that is right. There's a lot of brightness to the game, but in that, with all that brightness, to steal a terrible bit of, I don't know, alliteration or symbolism or whatever, like the sh the shadows that sort of exist in the world are very dark. So that those moments of exploitation or like definitely exist, but they're sort of always sort of pushed into the background a little bit. Right. And I think it's kind of cool to explore those moments that exist in that, in that world. Right. And then I got the first edition of the game. And while Malifaux is a really cool minis game, the company weird, they're not RPG makers. Right. And so it wasn't bad, but it wasn't all that it could be. Right. So the second edition has fixed a lot of the problems that they had with the first edition, and I'm super excited to get to the table and 
And we have really cool minis yeah, for it, this game already. Oh, it's just the minis are so <laughs> good. And I have a problem, as many of you may know, where I get a bug in my head and then I have to do it. So I bought a couple collections of Malifaux minis, more with the idea that I would use them to run the mini, run the uh, the RPG as opposed to play the actual game. So we have a pretty broad assortment of stuff, and I'm looking forward to trying to get this to the table because it is very cool and awesome. And yeah, I just I just like I like the world. I like the setup. I like the feel. I like the theme. It's just good. So through the breach, <laughs> looking forward to it. <laughs> so I have one last book laying out on the table, but it, it was more like a placeholder to not forget to mention other things that are coming out that I went to play. Uh, but so Tales from the Loop, I've ran um, a few times this year. I like it as just kind of a go-to run this on the spot game because uh, we talked about this when I ran it in the RPG day, but so, basically it's it's easy for me. I don't so. like kids games. It's not a kids game. I love this game. Well, where you play children. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Like I never was a you big like fan of that genre. When, when everybody was kids too, though. I, yeah. But I, I this is a great game. It's it just so game. good. So coming out, I, I didn't back it on Kickstarter because I was broke at the time, but <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, Things from the Flood is going to be the sequel to Tales from the Loop where um, you're in the, the teenage age range and uh, consequences are a little bit, uh, well, not a little bit, they are more fatal. Much higher. Um, and it's uh, yeah, you, know, you a cannot few years die after in this Tales from the Loop. Right. Death is not a, a piece of the game for Tales from the Loop because you're kids, but it is going to be in... In Things from the Flood, it is a thing, yeah. And this book is is absolutely beautiful. So whenever they actually release that, I'm assuming it will probably be at Gen Con this year because that's when all things come out. And and the artwork, there, there's already been a Things from the Flood uh, art book. Uh, so I know that portion of it is largely completed. And they're using the same um, kind of Mutant Year Zero base system um, that's also from Freely Publishing does Mutant Year Zero. Uh, Very cool. Yeah, basically. That's on my list. Things from the flood. All right. Right on. So I've got a list of things here that we were looking forward to that were coming out in the next year. Really quick to run through. And so one of them I actually have the PDF of. I don't have the physical copies yet because they're not finished being printed. But I have the Yellow King role playing game. (laughs) And I am looking forward to running it. And I haven't got the physical books. But I have read the first one on PDF. And I'm looking forward to getting that to the table this year. So that's going to be a good time. Uh, the second thing on our list is Wraith. Say in the Cthulhu vein, because there's another Cthulhu game too, right? The... Signs and Sigils. Yes. Yes, I have that on the list. <laughs> so it isn't done yet. I've, I've I've gotten a few emails about it from Kickstarter, about the design process and everything. So it looks like it's still continuing in development, but it isn't ready to be released yet. I've got a couple of play test things, but I haven't really dug into it yet. So because I've just had other things on the plate. I mentioned V5 already. And in the World of Darkness vein, we have... Wraith the Oblivion. <laughs> so, are they still writing that book? I have the PDF. <laughs> it is done. <laughs> However, I ordered the special edition because I'm a sucker for Wraith and it should be coming. They've gotten the final proofs for the cover and all that kind of stuff because there's a lot of pieces, a lot of, a lot of moving pieces to the between the regular edition and the special edition. Mm-hmm. So, I saw pictures of the binding for the special edition and it looks just wicked awesome and I'm super excited for it. So you guys can complain about me not running an Orpheus game once it arrives, once it arrives. So, But not before that. True. Because I told you I would restart once I got the Wraith, the Oblivion 20th anniversary. (laughs) So (laughs) moving swiftly on, uh, I had Eldritch Cock here on our list for things that we mentioned that were coming out this year, which did. And I was pleasantly surprised. And the playtest rules for the sort of modified version of Lamentations I'm super excited about. I like them. We've used probably 80% of those rules for a couple different games, and I'm going to use them to run our Hot Springs game. And I like them, and I'm super excited for them. And I think that's it that I have for things that are coming out this year. So do you have anything else on your list? I've got a couple other quick things to hit. but uh, So I already mentioned a Kid's Guide to Monster Hunting from the PIP system and um, a full version of Velvet Glove and things from the Flood. However, I do have a couple of other things. Um I didn't tell you about this one because it's supposed to be a gift, but the podcast is way more important than our personal lives. So I backed on Kickstarter, uh, the mountain witch, which is a samurai oh, blood yeah. opera game. And it's a, I guess a remake of an older game that yeah, I was not it's called the mountain at witch. all aware of. Yeah. 
Um, but doing it a second edition sounded of it? like something that you would like. To doing a second edition of it? Yes. Oh, wow. And it had some good like reviews from, you know, people that know about games. Not like, <laughs> not like me. <laughs> so I, I really wanted to play the Mountain Witch game, but I just... Well, I have good news for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't sure that like bringing it to our table and whatever, and I I really like the samurai thing. I just think it's mm-hmm. very cool and compelling, and I just never did. But that's really cool. Right on. So I don't know when that's actually going to be happening. Like the last update about it was like back after Gen Con sometime. So um, I guess it's still in the works. I completely missed that Kickstarter. <laughs> but the Kickstarter sucks. totally funded. So why does that suck? I, I found the Kickstarter. So well, no, what I'm saying though down. is, if you hadn't found it, then I wouldn't even have known about it. And there's a but problem here because <laughs> there are Kickstarters that I'm clearly missing. <laughs> Which, on a side note. I like Kickstarter a lot, but it has sort of taken some thunder out of Gen Con for me. True. Yeah. So that's kind definitely. of a bummer. A little somber note there about Gen Con. And last but not least, the thing that I am most excited for is Demon City. I just, I have that written down right here. So, so that should be coming out. And I we have a hard copy of that book. And I get to see the art. Yes. We're okay. going to get a hard copy of the book. Cool. Um, I have the, so as gonna... it is so far, PDF. Uh-huh. Um, which I actually have some time to read now, so that's on my to-do list as well. Um, so we can act- I can actually start getting us familiar with the system and stuff. So that was I'm a game that I was going to mention that I was excited, excited to play, that. and I almost feel like it's not fair to it's other not, games not fair. that involve <laughs> artwork. Well, there's there's like <laughs> there's Tales from the Loop. It's an art guy. There's the I, Genesis. That's an art guy. Yeah, I agree. But the it's it's not fair for everybody else that's <laughs> right. making RPGs now because that is not an artist. Because yeah. art is expensive, mm-hmm. and games like Demon City and anything that, that Zach has made for Lamentations and Tales from the Loop and the Genesis, it's just... It's like in another league. I yeah, agree. for sure. And the look of the game is such an important selling point for it. So really, really so good. And I'm I'm excited to see creators that are, that are coming into the RPG space that are making great, great RPGs that also have incredible artistic talents. So I'm super excited for it. I've got a couple other things here, just a quick mention. Cthulhu Confidential, I'm looking forward to. I, I want to do some gumshoe one-to-one. I'm super excited, and I haven't gotten to that yet, and that's my fault entirely. But now I have no excuse because you have time and you're out of school. So a uh, quick honorable mention to Vampire the Eternal Struggle. It's a great card game, and we used to have a bunch of cards, but I got rid of them for some reason and traded them for something else because I'm a moron. <laughs> and it's a lot of fun in a card game, and they're reproducing the cards now in Vamp. Black Chantry is making is re-releasing some cards and putting out some new sets. So I'm kind of fingers crossed hoping we might be able to get a little, little bit of a community going in Terre Haute and mm-hmm. see if we can't make something happen there. It's cool because you have like a circle table and you can only attack the player that's to your right. To the, and to the left. Or to your left, okay, and you're being attacked by the person from your right, uh, which makes, makes it a lot yeah. different. Negotiating. And it's... Infinitely a better game than Magic, which sucks. So, well, I read something the other day that actually said it was the best card game ever made, and I was like, it's "Wow, re- it's really good strategy wise." Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. and, great game! You know, customizable decks for each clan, and they're all very different. And yeah, it's, it's a solid game. So I'm hoping to get something going in Terre Haute with that because they're reprinting cards again and everything. So I've got a couple of things: is that I've been requested to run ten candles for some people. So I'm looking forward to doing some dark horror, and we'll see how that goes with JD and Holly. <laughs> so that should be a good, pleasantly bad time. I don't know how you say that. People have requested things for me, but I do what I want. I do what I want. <laughs> so the last thing I know, you guys have probably mentioned it probably a hundred times. Well, not a hundred times, but a lot is Troubadours. So plan for the next year is to continue to play test, and I know they say play test and play test a lot, but like this thing sort of sprung almost fully formed from the ether. And I don't know if it's beginner's luck or whatever, but it's worked really, really well. I know that when it comes to actually putting sort of rules down and sort of pros, it's, there's a lot of work to go from there. But as far as playing the game and with the game ends we've built, it's gone really, really well. So I'm I'm looking forward to getting to the game to the table with some complete strangers. Uh, we've we've done two play tests and one play test was with everybody in our normal gaming group and then another was with uh, half strangers basically, and it went really well as well. So we'll see how it goes, but those are going to be up on our Patreon and you can check those out as that game develops. So I've got high hopes for that and I've got kind of another idea sort of rolling around in the back of my head. We'll see how it goes involving railroads 
because we went to a railroad museum and I'm a sucker for trains and they're cool. And that time period is awesome anyway. Shout out to Through the Breach. <laughs> but I've got one last thing here to mention. And it's kind of an abstract thing is that I want to use props. I want to involve more props to the table this year. I don't know how I'm going to do that. I've got a 3D printer. That seems like a good way. I've got lots of other cool, <laughs> stupid ideas of how you put things together, and I'm kind of crafty anyway or whatever. So Pictures. We have all kinds of pictures. These. True story. I'm looking forward to trying to find a way to do some mysteries involving some props and seeing what we can't get to come from that. So I think that's my last thing. Do you have anything else? Yeah. What? Go for it. Let it rip. <laughs> uh, so. I may have had too much Jaeger. <laughs> we made the um, trauma table. And so I started the the poison table and got pretty far with it and kind of picked out some uh, open source images. They're um, actually sketches from uh, like 1800s of the 1800s. Um, what's the word? Botanical guides. Yeah. Botanical guides. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Big words. <laughs> I don't know what it was about the 1800s, but people could like write well and draw pictures good. And they stuff. had time. Um, unlike <laughs> now when people's handwriting is all absolutely terrible and, um, yeah, anyway, so, <laughs> um, so I got pictures together and put some thought into this, these tables and things, but it's a little bit bigger than what we did with the trauma table. Cause there's more there. And so then Kurt was like, you should make a chat book. And I was like, what the bejesus is a chat book. So after that conversation, <laughs> I think I could do that. And um, so there's some research material that I'm going to look over. And I'm, I think there's enough there uh, to, to do that and have it be meaningful. Uh, so that's one of my goals is to right get that going. So along those lines, I completely forgot, is that you mentioned in our Night Witches games that some of the mechanical failures have been kind of flat since we've been playing. Because we're about six sessions deep now. I did say that. And so I found... I th I. We talked about the trauma table and how it works and stuff, and I found an open source image of the actual PO2s. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm going to make a die drop table that is similar to the trauma chart for the airplanes. I like that. So I feel a little bad that I'm going to be responsible for this. Table. <laughs> yeah. So all of our uh, <laughs> Dasha and Gallia and Vera and Yulia can all thank you because this is going to be your fault. That so. Hurts. <laughs> in another life, I was a mechanic, so I have lots of experience with those sort of mechanical failures and the way things break and how things sort of tear apart. Maybe not in an airplane, but at least in an automobile. So I'm looking forward to doing that, and I'll put that up. And, and if you are running a Night Witches game, it should be an awesome tool for you to use, and hopefully it'll be make your add some um, some cool and interesting things to your combat sequences and when the planes go wrong. So the last thing I had was just uh, the blog. Oh, uh, yeah. The blog. Oh, the blog. <laughs> I've talked about resurrecting the blog. <laughs> I'm really, really, really going to start blogging. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. <laughs> so that's my goal for this year right. is to blog. It's like once a month or once every other week? Um, I think probably once every two weeks is reasonable. Okay. Right on. I think. Right. I agree. We I would, had, I would really had, like to enlist the help of someone else. Well, we had talked about getting it up and running to where we could do like once a month, where each of us could do once a month, and it right. wouldn't be that hard. So I think that's entirely feasible to do. So uh, unfortunately, most of my stuff has been geared towards Troubadours, which has been pushed to the Patreon. So that'll be exciting. I'm, I'm excited for it, and we'll see sort of where it develops and goes from there. And right on. Two other things, I guess, I kind of lump into one. So one is our indie RPG days. We really talked about trying to get out there and expose some people to more smaller press games, and we have definitely done that and been successful, and it's been lots of fun. And I like that we have – there's a small gaming shop, right? And, right? and inevitably, it's full of people who are gaming nerds. And in that group, you have a lot of D&D &D people, but there's always like one or two people that like know about all the games that are coming out and they've maybe they've read them. They might even have the books, but they've never been able to play them. And like, I like helping those people even more than I like helping the people that have never played a game before <laughs> right. or have never played anything outside of D&D &D before. I'm like, yes, you know, I get to I get to run this game for you so that you get to play it and experience it outside of just reading the material. Right. And I think that is just awesome. So I I love going to our indie RPG days. There are <laughs> so much fun and it challenges me in new ways because really the players are better. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, what I'm saying though is like when you go to run a con game, like you're all geared up to do it, you know? Right. And when we, every time when we go down there, we've done I put more effort into it. Well, I get butterflies. Mm-hmm. And some of these games I've ran several times and we're arriving there. And I'm like, oh, I'm jittery and I'm excited. Sweaty. And <laughs> it's just, it's one of those things where you, you know, they say the minute you lose that excitement, you should just stop. And it's nice to know that when I go to do this, I still have that kind of excitement and that giddiness and, and that a little bit of anxiety is good because it drives me. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And I just look forward to continuing to do it because we've been doing it for almost a year now, I think. And it's been great. It's been a lot of fun. And it has challenged me in new and interesting ways. And we've got games to the table that we may not have normally gotten to the table. And if nothing else, it's more gaming, right? And I... The whole reason I started to do it was because we sit here and we talk about games a whole lot and all this kind of stuff and blah, blah, blah. But sitting here and talking about it isn't really growing gaming. And I wanted to do something physical, like actually do something in the real world that would add to gaming. And I thought, what better way to do it than to just go run games for people? And that's sort of what spawned it all. And it has just been a great success and been so much fun. And I would encourage all... Anybody out there that wants to go try and find people that want to play story games or smaller press games, go to your local shop and find people and put app advertisements and run them and you will find those people because they're out there. Or run it online. Like if you don't have a local gaming store, you know, there's Discord, there's Roll20, there's, you know, Twitch streams and all kinds of resources. Out. There's so many people that want to play games. Right. Run, run the games for them. <laughs> so... It's sort of like a field of dreams things. If you build it, they will come, right? Like if you run the game, they will show up. Like people will come play these games because they're so good. So while there's a loads of people that are playing D and D, and if that's not your game, that's fine. But if you if you stay at it and you run these games, people will come up, come, and they will show show up and play your games because it's pretty much a a pretty. Cons- consistent group of people that are coming to play in our indie rpg games now yeah, and we have re- a, a steady rotation like we we have pretty much at least three players at every game now and um the rotating cast are probably right. up to like maybe like seven or eight different right. different people and it takes time that's the that's the big thing that i learned is i was like slow and steady wins the race you got to stay at it you got to keep showing up you got to keep doing it and you build that following and you do a good job and people come back and it's been a lot of fun, and it's been nice to know that we've been able to share some games with people that they probably wouldn't have ever played otherwise. So it's, yeah, it's been good. It's been a lot of fun. So I also plan to run at least two games at Hoosier Con this year, and I don't think I'm going to run any games at Gen Con that are dedicated to Gen Con. I really kind of like the idea of what we did last year, but trying to grow it a little bit more is where just, we, we get listeners together to say, hey, let's come together and play some games and have yeah. a good time. I don't think I'll ever sign up to run a a game at Gen Con again that isn't through like indie press or something like that right. where they have a designated space and people just pick games at the time because it's just so much but I really like the idea of getting well and people just drop things and I like I get it I've not showed up for games yeah. before that I signed it's up busy. for because the time just doesn't work out but like it, it sucks it sucks to donate like three or four hours of your time to run something to to not block have... off the time and... and it's one thing if nobody shows up I feel less bad about that than if not enough people show up to run right. the game and then you're like man I'm sorry one or two people that showed up like right. it sold four tickets I you know <laughs> <laughs> like then I feel like I'm wasting your time and that makes me feel worse. Right. Well, we'll be at Gen Con again this year and I'm not sure how, what it's going to look like, but we're going to try and put together some games for us to run at Gen Con. And I think we'll probably try and organize it a little bit better. Cause it was just sort of impromptu last time. It was like a, a guerrilla gaming thing where we just said, Hey, we're going to be here running games. If you guys want to come out and play, but we definitely want to get together with you guys and anybody else that comes to Gen Con and sort of put some names to faces and run some games and have a good time. Well, this one went a little long. We got a little wordy, but uh, yeah, no. it was a good time. <laughs> Not us. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have anything else for this episode or no? I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Well, a couple other episodes and things that we have in the works. Obviously, you guys know about our Night Witches actual play. We're working on a couple other episodes involving some stuff about running sat- satirical games, which you kind of mentioned earlier, and also running games that involve NPCs that might involve characters like Snape. And finishing out our Improving Your Fantasy Gaming series, because that's a thing. Follow through is good. 
We like it. <laughs> True. We've got, I think, one or two more episodes left in our fantasy gaming thing. Yeah. And then we're going to dig back into some World of Darkness things and talk about some of the new things for V5 and some of the ways we've seen to improve your uh, touchstones and convictions and some other things. So, as you guys know, we're a member of the Gunning Geek Network. So, quick promo for Better Podcasting, episode 161, Our Gear 2018, Steven Edition. This week, we kick off a two-episode annual tradition of talking about our personal podcast studio gear upgrades from the past year. This time, it's the Steven edition. In this, in this week's Better Podcasting download, we discuss how extensive the Pandora application form is and whether Pandora's goals are aligned with your intent as a hobby podcaster. Finally, we take listener feedback, including the series of responses about everyone's most valued and most disappointing podcast gear purchases. So that is Better Podcasting episode 161. You can check them out on the Getting Geek Network. As always, thanks for hanging out with us, and hopefully you guys have a lot of great gaming in 2019, as we are hoping to have as well. And hopefully we can see you guys at Gen Con or at Hoosier Con or any other places that we're going to go out this year. Hopefully you guys had a good holiday season and a good new year, and we will see you guys next week. Thanks for listening. This has been an episode of Just One More Fix. Music has been provided by Kevin McLeod. You can find him at incompetech.com. You can support us at patreon.com slash justonemorefix or follow us on Twitter at justonemorefix. 